So um, thank you, Nadia, first of all, and good evening, everyone. Um, if you do have questions, pop them in the uh, chat. Uh, do we have a chat or? We do. I forget. Yeah, pop them in the chat and um, I'll open mine up so I can see them as they come in. Um, that way I kind of know where we're at. And if there are a bunch of questions, I'll stop and answer them. And then um, if there are none until the end, then we could wait till the end. Um, I do have to apologize. Vernal pools are one of my favorite things to talk about. And so um, last time I talked about amphibians, if anyone was on that talk last year at the beginning of COVID, I think I ran over an hour. I plan not to run over an hour today, I promise you. But um, this is one of the topics that I really enjoy. This brings me great joy during the year in the springtime. It's one of my favorite places to be around these vernal pools. And so um, hopefully you find the same magic as I do. Um, my background, if anyone could see my uh, background, is a friend that we actually found, let's see, yesterday. Um, I took that picture yesterday. So it was a friend that we found right by the vernal pool and we'll talk about him in a little bit. So um, please bear with me with technology. It sometimes does not like me. So today we're gonna to talk about vernal pool ecology and their importance within the life cycle of amphibians in particular. Now, vernal pools are home to many animals and we can go on and on about the types of macro invertebrates that can be found, but we're gonna focus on amphibians today. And the reason being is amphibians are in a global crisis. About 40% of all amphibians across the world are in some kind of critical population decline. And 40% is a lot. So we want to take a look at our amphibian populations and our species and what's happening. And a lot of times it means looking right in our backyards, right at a local level in order to help the species out. So here in New York, we do have many that are in need of our help. So we'll talk about those and how maybe we can mitigate some of these. Um, this year, we, and every year we do a, um, survey for the New York State DEC, and we've definitely seen changes over the last couple of years, this year in particular, and I'll share, you, I'll share a little bit of that when we get there. So a review of what vernal pools are. Vernal pool, if you know the word vernal from the vernal equinox, it is a temporary body of water that forms in the springtime. They're also known as ephemeral pools. So like the word spring ephemeral, right? Those are your springtime plants. So vernal pools or ephemeral pools, springtime pools, they all mean the same thing. And the major part of what makes them what they are is that they are temporary in nature. They are developed in low or depressed ground areas. A lot of time you'll find them in forests. And so you have a lot of woodland vernal pools. Hopefully it's filling with the melting snow of winter and the heavy rains of spring. We don't always get a nice heavy winter and we don't get a rainy spring all the time. So they're dependent fully on the precipitation that we have throughout the winter and into the spring. Because they are temporary and because of their temporary nature, there are no fish that live in vernal pools. This makes that unique from every other water body system. So the fish need water to survive. It's not like Dr. Seuss where they walk on their gills or their fins and get woefully weary, but they, um, they cannot live in temporary bodies of water. And so because of this fish who happen to be a very big predator for many invertebrates and amphibian species do not exist in vernal pools. They're not typically connected to big permanent bodies of water like lakes, streams, and rivers. Although you might get ones that have a temporary runoff from these lakes and um, bigger rivers, but they are not permanently connected. So sometimes when you get a flood, uh, the flood in the spring or the heavy rains, right, these temporary streams will appear and that might feed these vernal pools, but they're not going to sus be sustained. Um, they are the breeding sites for a number of diverse animals. And like I said, especially amphibians and insects. And what's also quite unique is vegetation is usually absent from these vernal pools. 
Um, you would think that you have a lot of uh, things growing because you have the nice soil from the forest, but there's a lot of shade because it's in the forest. So there are a lot of adjacent trees growing, maybe some shrubs around the side, but within the pool itself, you don't have things like lily pads growing. You don't have the uh, wetland reeds like Phragmites or cattail growing. You have mostly detris on the bottom, so a lot of leaf litter. Sometimes it's a little muddy, but a lot of times it's just the leaf litter that's underneath, and that provides a unique habitat as well. Um, we look at the health of these vernal pools by looking at the vegetation that's growing, and one disturbing trend that we are seeing is an increase of grasses and algae growing within these vernal pools that are close to human development. And one reason that could be is runoff from people who use fertilizer and the increase of these um, plant this plant material within the water will affect the chemical makeup, the dissolved oxygen, the nitrates, the phosphorus within the water and make it not as um, inviting for a lot of these creatures, especially the amphibians who are super sensitive to any kind of change in the environment. And that is a disturbing trend that we are seeing. And my clicker doesn't work, there we go. So what do vernal pools look like? Well, here's an example of a vernal pool. This is one at T-Town. And you can see that it, you might walk past it. It's very small, it's not obvious. It's hidden behind these trees and the fallen logs. And if you're not looking for it and or a little further away, you might walk right past it, not knowing that you have this body of water here. It is small and shallow, and so it is prone to drying up. If we have a dry springtime, the pool may dry up um, prematurely. And I'll tell you a little bit why that can be a problem. So why, why are we talking about vernal pools? Um, Vernal pools, they help limit flooding. So they act as retaining pools and they help uh, reduce the, the flooding and the erosion um, on lands. It recharges the groundwater and that's very important. What we don't think is all the amount of water that's underneath the soil, underneath our feet and what the vernal pools do because they're holding that water in and eventually that water will seep down into the ground. It helps recharge that ground water. Again, it reduces the erosion by being these retaining pools. And of course, they're critical breeding and rearing grounds for many, many animals. By law, many vernal pools are not protected. And because they are small and temporary, they're often um, maybe involved within a wetland system, but they're not protected like big bodies of water, like lakes and streams and rivers are. Um, even when they are protected, usually the surrounding habitat is very fragmented. And that leads to other problems when we talk about the living things that are inside of it. Uh, I do see a question, where are the vernal pools at T-Town? Well, we have vernal pools that are scattered throughout T-Town. Um, some of them are off trail and are more sensitive areas. So um, if you take a hike on Shadow Lake, they're right past Shadow Lake on the Three Lakes Trail. Um, there are some vernal pools that you can see from the trail. Uh, over by Hidden Valley where Vernay Shortcut Trail hits the Hidden Valley Trail. There are, a, there are a couple vernal pools that you can see there as well. But a lot of the sites that we monitor are off trail and are away from the trails um, for pr their own protection. And so um, unfortunately, I won't give all the locations away. So that being said, let's move on to the main focus of amphibian morphology and the species specifically that use vernal pools as a breeding ground and kind of discover why for me it's so magical at least. So as a review, what is an amphibian? I think a lot of people get amphibians and reptiles confused. And again, I can talk for hours on end on both subjects. So um, to make it short, amphibian comes from the word, the Greek word amphibious, which means both, both lives, dual life. And that is because of their metamorphic nature. 
So they are a vertebrate animal and they have bones inside their bodies. Even though they might look like mush, they have a skeleton inside. They are classified into our frogs and toads, our salamanders and newts, and finally our Sicilian, which we do not have around here. So really here in New York, we're only concerned about our frogs and toads and salamanders and newts, the anura and caudata. They are scaleless, ectothermic, meaning cold-blooded. I don't like that word. Anyone who's ever come to any of my programs or talks know I do not like the word cold-blooded. It makes them sound mean or evil, especially when we talk about reptiles. So I like the scientific word ectothermic. It's more descriptive as well. Ecto being outside of thermic is heat. So the heat source from the outside. And for them, that's the sun, the heat of the sun. And that will warm their bodies up and give them the ability to then metabolize nutrients um, and their food. What makes them very special is this highly permeable skin that amphibians have. This skin will allow liquid to pass through. So imagine we drink through our mouth to hydrate and a dog laps up water. But if you are an amphibian, in order for you to drink per se, you're going to sit in water and absorb it. If you've ever seen maybe a picture of a tree frog sitting on a small bird bath or in a little leaf with a little bit of water in it, it's they're absorbing it through their skin into their body, kind of like a sponge. And then what else passes through the skin is oxygen. And there are some species of amphibian who are lungless. So they do not develop a typical respiratory system with lungs and their gas exchange happens at the skin level. So the skin will exchange the oxygen. That being said, water and oxygen, the good things, the things that should be passing through the skin membrane are not the only things. Chemicals, disease are also very prone to passing. And so because of this, the amphibians become super sensitive to change in environments. And we kind of call them eco indicators because of that. They tell us what's going on in the environment. If we see a big amphibian die off in one habitat, we know, hey, there's something that's happening here that we need to find. What is the change? Is it salinity? Is it dissolved oxygen? Is it the pH? Is it um, some kind of pathogen, a bacteria, a fungus, virus that might be living in this pool? Or is it the temperature of the water, which we're starting to see? They can uh, reproduce with external or internal fertilization. And of course, they undergo that metamorphosis that we'll talk about, that big change. There are over 6,500 unique species of amphibian around the world, but there are so many that we have not discovered yet. And what's really interesting is here in New York, we did discover a new species or a subspecies um, not that long ago, within the last 10 years, and it was discovered based off of its call. So the northern leopard frog and the southern leopard frog are now classified as two different species, and we now know that they both live in New York State. Um, so that's pretty cool. Usually when we hear about new species of amphibian, we think um, they're coming out of the rainforest, those really hot biodiversity spots, Madagascar, Costa Rica, Belize, uh, Papua New Guinea. Those are all very big sp spots that they're finding these new amphibians. Unfortunately, as they're finding many species, we're losing more than we're discovering. And so again, they are in that big crisis. So within New York State, um, I'll skip over, the, these are kind of slides from my herp herpetology talk, so we'll skip over the reptiles, but within New York State, we have 18 species of salamanders. That's a pretty high number. 14 species of frogs and toads. Of these, 45% of all our reptiles and amphibian species are listed under New York State because of some type of protection or concern. Um, that's a lot uh, for 45%. So that's above the world average. Nine are listed as endangered. And we're talking reptiles and amphibians at this point. Five are listed as threatened and 13 special concern. Now, 
the numbers are changing. There are there are some proposals within the New York State DEC to adjust some of these uh, classifications based off of new population studies, but it has not passed through yet um, because of the delays with COVID and short staffing. So these were proposed before COVID and we'll see some change coming. Um, I think the numbers are mostly headed in a good direction uh, because of the efforts that have been put in to help the habitats that these animals live in. Um, I don't remember offhand if any of the reptiles or amphibians went the other way on the list. I believe most of the changes happened in a positive manner. So that's really good to know. So this goes back to first grade kindergarten when we learned about life cycles. Um, frogs lay eggs and these eggs are kind of this jelly mass and we'll see them a little later on. The eggs hatch out into little tadpoles and they're, they have these like scraper-like mouthpieces that they're going to scrape off algae and plant material and they're going to remain herbivorous and grow in the water. They're breathing through gills and they have a very strong tail in order to maneuver. As they start to grow, hind legs begin to appear, followed then by front legs, and the tail starts to recede into the body. It doesn't fall off. It doesn't poof, disappear like magic. It reabsorbs into nutrients into the body. And then eventually, the frog is going to crawl out on land. It's going to lose its ability to, to breathe through gills and it's gonna develop lungs and it's gonna become carnivorous. So as an adult, it eats things like invertebrates, uh, worms and uh, insects. So we have a tadpole that lives in water and breathes through gills that eats vegetation and that's going to change or metamorphosize into an adult that for the most part are land dwelling, breathe through lungs and are carnivorous and eat meat. So that's a big change. That's pretty much a 180 right there. Similarly, the salamander has a, a similar lifestyle, life cycle. It's going to start off as that jelly egg. It's gonna hatch out into a larva and you can see the larva. Uh, let's see if I can do this properly with technology. Um, you could see the larva here. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Oh, technology. So you could see, eh, maybe, no, it doesn't want to do it. Why am I having so much trouble? There we go. There we go. So these feathery gills, they're external gills that come off behind the neck of the amphibian. And those feathery gills are what they're going to breathe through. So they're external gills, unlike most fish and the frogs have internal gills. These are external gills. Um, they kind of look like those feathers. And they're going to keep on growing and then eventually come out on land and become either a lunged salamander, they're going to develop lungs, or they become a lungless salamander and breathe through their skin. So not all amphibians though are gonna use these vernal pools. There are some like the two-line salamander or redback salamander, they breed on the sides of wetlands. So it doesn't have to be a vernal pool, but often we do find them by the vernal pools. Uh, slow moving streams, uh, anywhere around a swamp or a marsh, and they're going to lay their eggs on under logs, so on the ground. You also have bullfrogs and green frogs who may spend more than one year in their larva stage. And because they're spending more than one year in their larva stage, they cannot live in a temporary body of water. And so they lay their eggs in permanent bodies like the lakes and ponds. That's not to say you won't find bullfrogs and green frogs hanging out in vernal pools. They just won't lay their eggs in the vernal pools. 
typically bullfrogs are voracious eaters and they might try to snack on some of the vernal pool breeders, unfortunately. But that's the, that's the uh, risk they're taking by laying eggs in vernal pools, right? Um, they don't have fish, but there are other predators out there. So we also have some, and not many in New York, but the marbled salamander is a good example that are autumnal breeders. So the opposite of vernal is autumnal, and that's going to be a fall time breeder. There are pools, temporary bodies of water that do fill in the fall. And so these autumnal breeders will breed in those pools. Oftentimes they will spend either their life as an egg or a larva stage over winter and then metamorphosize the following year. There are a lot of insects that also complete their life cycle this way, where either the egg or the larva stage will overwinter. And then by the next spring, the adult will, they will metamorphosize into an adult and the adult will then breed. So, um, and a, a good example of one of these, uh, besides the marbled salamander, would be praying mantis. Uh, praying mantis, they're obviously not a vernal pool breeder. They are, uh, they're going to breed in the field, but they will lay their egg sac over the course of the fall. And that egg sac overwinters. Springtime comes and it bursts and hundreds of little baby praying mantises come rushing out. The adult does not live through the winter. The, once they lay their eggs, they die. So that's how their life cycles um, kind of look like. So who are we talking about? Well, we've got a lot of different frogs and toads that live in New York. The bold ones on your right side are the ones that are common or more likely to be found in our area. The, um, that's not to say you, you can't find others. Uh, we have found fowler's toads in Westchester. I found a mink frog, which is a more Northern species. That was an odd find but you can still find other species. These are just the ones that are more common within our area. Of these, we have four of who are vernal pool breeders. So it's the American toad, the gray tree frog, spring peeper, and the wood frog. All the others lay eggs in permanent bodies of water. So let's talk about our toad. He's a little different from our other frogs because his skin is kind of dry. They're pretty easy to identify. And because the fowlers is a little more rare in our area, most of the toads you're gonna find are gonna be the American toad, which is this guy here. They vary in color and size. So once they metamorphosize from a tadpole, they'll be about the size of your pinky nail and they can grow to be, be about the size of a small fist. They have these swollen glands behind their eyes. And what those glands do is if something gets a hold of it, it will secrete almost like a bitter glue-like substance. It's not really poisonous to the effect that it's going to kill an animal. It just tastes really bad. And the animal will hopefully spit out the toad and the toad will live. There are some animals that do specialize in toads, however. There's the hognose snake that exclusively eats American toads within the Eastern United States. And so they don't taste the bitterness and they will, they love toads. That's all they'll eat. Um, you'll find them all across the, uh, New York state with the exception of Long Island. And they are late spring breeders. So what's kind of cool about nature is nature has its own timeline and animals take their turn so that there's less competition for resources. We see it in birds. The first ones to breed are our owls in the dead of the winter. And then we are still waiting on things like our robins. They haven't started breeding yet. Our swan has just started building a nest on T-Town Lake. So animals will take their um, turn to use the resources available. And during breeding season, there are, is a need for more resources. 
there's a need for more energy in within the food web to flow to feed all these little babies. And so American toads are not the first ones to breed. They will breed later on about mid to late spring into early summer. And then metamorphosis occurs within one to two months. Their tadpoles are very small. So they have very small tadpoles. And once they metamorphosize, they kind of do it all at once. And sometimes it almost looks like the forest floor is moving from all these little baby toads that have just metamorphosized and come onto land. They are terrestrial once they are an adult. So they won't be hanging around the pools. They won't be hanging around bodies of water. They're going to be in the forest. They're going to be in the field. They're going to be under someone's deck. Um, in someone's garden. So these guys are fully terrestrial. A lot of times you'll find them at night, but uh, you can see them during the day as well. And they hunt, like to hunt the insects and other invertebrates that most frog species do. I'm sure you've all heard this guy. This is my way of knowing spring has come. So Birders out there, they listen for their red-winged blackbird. I listen for the spring peeper. The spring peeper is going to be that lovely peeping sound that we hear at nighttime, sometimes during the day. If we get too close to where they are, they'll all go quiet. And you'll, you're imagining to yourself, there was all this sound just a minute ago, and now it's silent. These guys are very small. They're about the size of my thumb. So... Imagine maybe hundreds of them in this vernal pool area and you come across it and you can't see even one of them. That's how small and how well camouflaged these guys are. So they all have this X that goes down its, on its back and that's where it gets its name, oops, Crucifer. It's scientific name, Crucifer. So they're identified by the X that goes down its back right there. All of them bear that. They come in many different shades from tan to bright orange to red to kind of darker colors, but they're all going to have that X. So take a look for that. They also, if you look at their feet, have swollen discs on their toes. This is a feature of tree frogs. So they are part of that family of tree and reed frogs. They are mostly nocturnal, most active at night. That's when they're going to breed. They're gonna come out really early in the spring, the, almost the first ones to come out with the wood frogs, um, March to May, although in this area it's March to April, they will breed and metamorphosis occurs two to three months later. Um, I can tell you right now that the spring peepers, that first we started to see migration happen mid-March this year. It was a little late. So mid-March to mid-April, we now have little baby tadpoles of the spring peepers swimming in the vernal pool. So that's the update from T-Town. Spring peepers have hatched and you got little tadpoles swimming all around. Very, very fun. They're very cute. They're very small. Then we have our wood frog. Wood frogs are quite interesting. Um, they are the most cold tolerant of our frog species. And they do something really interesting that not all amphibians can do. Instead of really kind of going deep underground into a mammal burrow and escape uh, by going below what we call the frost line. That's the imaginary line underground where everything above can freeze, but below it will stay just above freezing. So they can actually stay within the, the frost area. And it's quite interesting. I did not pull a video of this, but there are plenty of like really high quality National Geographic or BBC uh, nature documentary videos of this. They will freeze themselves their bodies will freeze and they operate on a cellular level to stay alive. So their cells are going to produce 
sugars that then ferment and that fermentation process keeps them alive through the winter. And so in the springtime, they're not really waking from hibernation. They're actually thawing out, which is pretty cool. The wood frog has a distinct raccoon mask over their face. And they also are very varied in color. So I've seen ones bright orange. I've also seen ones typically tan like this to more of a yellow color. Um, and they are early breeders, just like the spring peeper. They're gonna be the first ones out in March and April. Unfortunately, this year at T-Town, we have not yet found a batch of wood frog eggs. And we know that they're there. We just don't know where. And so we're searching our vernal pools to see where they went and why they're not in the vernal pools that they typically go to. Um, these are questions we wanna know. We do know that one of our vernal pools, the chemical makeup has changed. We do know that. And that's due to the lack of rain the last two springs. It was very dry and it allowed more vegetation to grow, which then changes the whole chemical makeup of the pool. So we know we're not finding as much in that pool because of this kind of increase of vegetation from directly from the amount of precipitation the past two years. This year, the pools are in good shape. They're in good size, but you need to see the trend. You need to look what happened previous years. And that's where working with the New York State DEC and the Hudson River Estuary Program, they're keeping records and we're trying to correlate it with different changes in the environment, including climate change and the use of fertilizer nearby, road salt, um, and pharmaceuticals that get out into these bodies of water. At T-Town, we've been monitoring our vernal pools for a number of years, over a decade at least. So we have good historical data going back and seeing how these guys have changed and how our pools have changed. But that is one thing that we did notice this year was that our wood frog populations or at least egg masses um, did decline and we're in search of where they might be at now. So the one that I did not put on here because it's not really a spring breeder is our gray tree frog. Gray tree frogs are um, a early summer breeder. What's interesting about the gray tree frog is that they're rolling the dice really on will they have enough time to breed? And this might be because climate change is um, making the vernal pools dry out faster and they are not lasting as long into the summer and they gray tree frogs have not yet adapted to this change, but typically they're going to breed in May to June. And by the time their eggs hatch and become tadpoles, we're into July. A lot of our vernal pools at T-Town are starting to dry up by July, if not already dried up. And so our summer camp often ends up raising some gray tree frogs because they have found them dying in these vernal pools and the, the birds will just pick them off. And so this is something that we have seen a trend in that they are not having, they're running out of time. They're not having the proper time in order to um, lay their eggs and fully metamorphosize uh, before the vernal pools are drying up. And, you know, we don't know for sure, but my speculation is because of climate change um, and the patterns that we're seeing that they just haven't had the time to adapt to it and change the way they breed and when they breed. And so that is something that we're seeing there. So that brings us to our order, um, our family caudata. Caudata um, are our salamanders and our newts. The word salamander is actually very interesting. It comes from an Arab word, meaning born of fire. And you might think, what does fire have to do with these moist um, animals that need water all the time? Well, when people used to throw logs into a fireplace to start a fire, 
salamanders would run out from underneath. And so they thought it was coming straight out of the fire. And that's where the word salamander came from. So they like wood, the, the old rotted logs, especially when it's nice and moist outside. That's where these guys are going to hang out. They are usually long, slender bodies, but not always. A pretty long tail. And they have, depending, a three to four stage life cycle. So I'll talk about that when I bring up the slide on the newt. That changes things a little bit. Again, to the side, the ones in the bold color, um, they are our more native ones, the ones you'll more likely see. Um, unfortunately, there are some really great salamanders on this list that live in New York, but you can't find here. My favorite being the hellbender. Um, they are a super sensitive species. You need pristine, clear running water, cold, like from the mountains. That's why that you find them out in, towards at the Allegheny and um, kind of rare here in New York. Pennsylvania has made them the state, uh, state amphibian. Um, there are some great conservation efforts going on with hellbenders, uh, one of them being from the um, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Bronx Zoo. Uh, they're doing some great work with hellbenders, but unfortunately, we do not have them in Westchester as much as I would love. Uh, we do have our two mole salamanders, the spotted and the marbled. The marbled is that autumnal breeder. Um, they are heavier bodied salamanders and they are lunged. We have our newts, so the eastern newt, and then we have our lungless salamanders like the dusky, the two-line, four-line, redback, and the slimy. So um, the dusky and slimy aren't as seen that often. They do, they they are here, but they're not as common. Four-toed wasn't really common, but this year we saw a lot of four-toed salamanders. That was something new for us. Um, redback and two-line are our most common. They are the ones that this two lines are going to hang out by the slow moving streams and the red backs are going to be the ones under the logs in the forest. So many different kinds, but let's talk about the special one, the spotted salamander. He's a beauty or she, um, hard to tell by the picture, but this one is a beauty. And um, one of my favorites, definitely uh, my favorite native amphibian, um, is a spotted. You cannot mistake it for anything else. It is big bodied, black base with the yellow spots running down its back. Its belly does not have those yellow spots. It's kind of speckled with almost a bluish white color, um, almost like someone took paint and flicked it all over it. They do live in moist soil areas close to these vernal pools. However, they spend most of their life underground in mammal burrows. So we don't typically see them outside of breeding season. They are exclusive breeders to vernal pools. They will not lay their eggs anywhere else. And we're gonna talk about migration a little bit, but many do die on the road during this migration period. And they are very sensitive to the pH level of the water bodies and the soil. A lot of times we forget when we talk about Water, the water does affect also soil and the soil can be acidic as well. So the acidity level of the soil affects these guys. Our friend, the newt. The newt um, is an early breeder and you might see it has two almost adult stages. So if we remember back to the life cycle of a salamander, they start off as an egg, then they become that gilled larva with the external gills. Well, the newt goes from that larval stage to an in-between stage that we call an eft. And so this eft is that bright orange one at the bottom here, the red eft we call it. They are fun to find because they're so vibrant. And this is the terrestrial stage of life for the newt. It's almost like their teenage stage, their adolescent stage. It's a sub-adult at this point. As they get bigger, they'll change into a darker color, start to become olive 
they're going, their tail is going to flatten out. And if you start to see a red eft with those features, you know, it's close to metamorphosizing again, changing again into an adult. The adult is the one you see on top. It is going to live in water. So they go from an aquatic life to a terrestrial life back to an aquatic life. And that's what makes newts different from salamanders. And these guys in particular have that red eft stage. They will also be found in permanent bodies of water, but they do prefer the vernal pools where there's less competition and there's um, less predation that happens. Oftentimes I find them in swamps and marshes as well. Rarely do I find them in something as big as Teatown Lake, however. And even though breeding does tend to occur late spring, they, they have started breeding already here. We found at least one egg mass from them. So when we talk about migration, what are we really talking about? Um, I know I've thrown that out a little bit and I want to explain a little more detail. So amphibians, they're going to hibernate either in mammal tunnels or um, on rocky hillsides where they're going to catch those first kind of bright rays of warm spring sun that'll help keep them warm and wake them up. But they're not going to move, not until there's moisture, warm precipitation. And because most of these animals are nocturnal, they wait till nighttime. So we are looking for warm spring nights over 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't seem warm, 40 degrees in the rain doesn't seem warm, but it's warm compared to the winter. That has sustained rains during the daytime into night with a thawed ground. So these are your requirements. This will trigger amphibians to move from where they've hibernated during the winter to the breeding grounds. Many times it's towards the woodland vernal pool. They will migrate in big numbers. We call them the big nights. And unfortunately, the last couple of years, we haven't had many of these big nights. We used to have a lot more. This year was a lot better. But the last couple of years, we've had kind of spurts of maybe a couple going and then some going at like three o'clock in the morning when we're not going to be out to monitor the roads. But we're not seeing the consistent big nights that we used to. And we basically go out as volunteers for the New York State DEC Hudson River Estuary Program. We go out um, to monitor the roads and also take a census to send to the DEC. You can join this program. It's a citizen science project, so it's open to everyone and anyone who wants to. You can join it by going to the DEC's website and watching training videos. This season is already over, but you can kind of get an idea for what is in store for next season. Watch training videos, you can attend an uh, this year was via Zoom. We usually offer it at T-Town. Um, we're one of the training sites for Westchester Putnam area. Um, I myself am one of the um, coordinators here. So if you need a group to go out with, or if you're looking to join a group or want to just go out with an established group, you can contact me come maybe February of next year, right after our Eagle Fest time, because I'm a little busy during Eagle Fest. But Right after then, we're starting to think of amphibian migration. We also um, can offer you suggestions how to find your own spot. And really, that's what I want. That's my goal by offering these training sessions and by um, having volunteers come out with me is learn how to do it. Learn what you're looking for, what you're doing, how to submit the data, and then build your own group in your communities. It's great that we're monitoring the T-Town roads, but they're going to be monitored no matter what. I'm going to be out there no matter what. But find areas within your community, targeted areas. I found a new spot in my community this year that I didn't think was an issue. Um, I knew that there was a wetland there. I knew that there were amphibians that hung out there, but I didn't know how much of an issue the road was because it's a very, very low-traveled road. 
But from what I saw this year, I now know that it is a hot spot and I need to monitor it or I'm going to ask some volunteers to go out and monitor that area from now on. So I can help you identify those areas within your community or maybe you know of some already. So these pictures are from this year. I know they're whole, hiding their faces, but that's Nadia underneath the hood. I'm gonna point that out, Nadia, that there you are, so fashionable. Um, very, very flattering, thank you. <laughs> so we're out, you can see it's raining. We're wearing safety vests. Um, how I do it, I like to have a chase car behind us just to protect us even more. Um, and we are counting the number of amphibians. We are counting the number of dead amphibians. It's not just the live ones. We are helping them across the street in the direction of the known vernal pool. And we're taking down all the data as far as the conditions, the weather, the weather for the past 24 hours, the temperature, the species, the number of species deceased versus live and which direction they were facing and what part of the road we were on. So there's a lot of data going into this, um, again, being compiled, thankfully not by me, but by the New York State DEC. Um, Emma Clemens is in charge of the data part of that and she does an amazing job. So these are some pictures from our migration this year. We have a very gravid wood frog on um, the top corner here. So you can tell it's a female because she's so big. Look how round she is. She's got eggs in there. So that's a female. This could be a female judging by the, the stomach here. Hard to say, but if you look, you can see that. Whoop. Oh no, what happened? I pressed something I shouldn't have. Um, you can see the obvious X going on the back. This is a spring peeper. It's very small. Uh, these pictures are magnified a bit. And then over here is a spotted salamander. This is one of the first nights we were out. And you can see it's swollen hind here instead of the swollen belly. This is a male. And um, the males for spotted salamanders are going to migrate before the females. And the females find the males by following a pheromone trail. So unlike the frogs that are going to call the salamanders smell each other. A little different, a little interesting. So unfortunately, you did get to see a little preview. The next slide is not for the uh, faint of heart. It's a little graphic, so just a disclaimer there. Unfortunately, this is the problem. Many amphibians during their migration, because of habitat fragmentation, cross roads and road mortality is high. Sometimes you approach a road and it's just carnage all over the road. And you can't imagine these are small animals. You have a spring peeper there in the middle. How does this little spring peeper the size of my thumb get hit by a car? And so many of them get hit. And so this is why we're out there as volunteers trying to help. If you can't volunteer, the best thing you can do is encourage your everyone you know and your friends and neighbors to stay off the roads during these migration periods, these high peak times, and that'll help save some of these lives here. So up here in this corner, this is a four-toed salamander. This is a spring peeper. We've got a, a spotted salamander. And what's interesting about this one on the bottom, those are eggs. This is an American toad. This was a female. And so those are eggs that she had inside of her. Um, so obviously we don't like seeing the dead animals, but it is part of, um, why we're doing what we're doing with this, the migration and helping them get to these vernal pools where they will successfully breed. So again, frogs call by, uh, find their mate by calling. They make unique sounds based off of their species. That's how they discover the Southern versus Northern leopard frogs. So they make different sounds. Um, and salamanders release pheromones to locate each other. Salamanders fertilization occurs internally. The male deposits a spermatophore, um, which is in this like gelatinous cone. Um, and then the female will take the mass and push it within her. And that fertilizes the egg, whereas frogs fertilize their eggs externally. The males um, may 
create a sperm nest. So a lot of tree frog species, not as many around here, but uh, more tropical tree frogs, they'll make a nest of sperm um, up in a leaf or a overhanging a tree. And the females then lay the eggs into that and that fertilizes them. Most, however, will mate um, using amplexus, which is when the male will grasp the female um, behind her head and underneath her arms or her forelegs um, and really grasp hold like, like he's piggybacking on her. Uh, males tend to be smaller than the females and um, they position their cloaca, which is the only hole they have. Um, and that's where poop happens, that's where pee happens, and that's where uh, breeding happens. So cloaca, um, birds have a cloaca as well. Mammals do not. So um, when we talk about cloaca, that's what we're talking about. They will place it close to each other and the female lays the eggs as the male fertilizes, similar to how some species of fish do it. So here's an example, and I hope that my sound is working. Let me just make sure. There we go. All right. So this is a video I took a couple of years ago of a spring peeper during meeting season. You can kind of really tell how loud that little one is. Um, they get very loud and that's just one little tiny one. So um, they're amazing. And that's one of my favorite sounds to listen to. Here we have a pair of wood frogs in amplexus. So this is where the male again is grasping the female behind the head and underneath the forearms right here. Females on the bottom, it's the bigger one. And the male is here on the top. So then it comes to egg masses. Once breeding happens, they lay these eggs. This is within the vernal pool. You can see the leaf litter that creates the floor of the vernal pool, right? All the detritus. Um, so we're not talking about like a sandy bottom or a rocky bottom or a muddy bottom like some lakes, right? This, this is a woodland vernal pool. So th this has a lot of leaf litter on the bottom. And so we have egg masses that are in a gelatinous material. Um, this gelatinous material helps protect them. We have what are um, frog eggs on the one side, and you have the embryos within the frog eggs on the other side. So you could see this shape of the tadpole forming. This was pretty close to when they laid the egg. So this is probably a week worth of growth within the egg mass. So when we look at these eggs, and there have been a lot of questions on um, social media I've seen about what they've, what people have been finding, which is kind of cool to see so many people finding these. Um, salamander egg masses are going to look kind of like eyeballs staring back at you. They're in a gelatinous um, kind of real big sack. So what you can't really see in this picture because it's polarized is there is a sac, a gelatinous sac going all around here and it encapsulates all of the eggs. Whereas frog eggs, they're in the, the gelatinous material, but they're individual. So they're a little more spherical bumps um, around the edges, unlike this where it's encapsulated. And so the frog eggs tend to also be a little more clear and don't look like the eyeball shape that you'd see with a salamander. And then the toad is the only one who lays them in a string like this. So these are pictures from, oops, this is a picture from last week um, at T-Town. All of this, 
in here, all of this. These are all eggs. These are all egg masses right here. That's all egg mass. And when we look closely at them, here's what they look like inside. These are our spring peeper eggs. They are very small and the tadpoles are very small that are hatching out. But so these are our spring peepers. They lay in these giant masses, obviously not just one frog laid this, this is lots of frogs um, coming together and making this gelatinous mass that we see here. Oops, my camera. So these eggs here, um, one was taken last week and the other was taken this week. So we have some salamander eggs and you can sort of see, here's the outline of that membrane, that sac that's around it. And then if this was frog eggs, you'd see the individual eggs on the edges like this. It'd be more spherical, more bumpy instead of one giant gelatinous blob. Here's another example. This is from yesterday. This is spotted salamander eggs and you can see it's in this gelatinous encasing um, and they look like eyeballs inside. These haven't gone opaque yet because these are very freshly laid. That was again a week ago and these were within a week. Um, they're now opaque and it looks like eyeballs staring back at you. So those are our salamander eggs. Not as many this year as I would have hoped. So once those eggs hatch and babies start to grow, we get metamorphosis, which makes us amphibians amphibians. And this occurs within the vernal pool and then they'll disperse from it. So metamorphosis is regulated by the thyroid hormone thyroxin and it stimulates this change. The organs such as gills, fin, and tail become redundant. They don't need them on land, so they get reabsorbed back into the body through controlled cellular death called apoptosis. Uh, salamanders remain carnivorous through their whole lives. So as larvae, they're going to um, eat uh, like larval stages of insects, so like mosquito larvae, which is great. Um, we don't like mosquitoes too much, so um, they'll eat other insects and stuff at, at the larval stage. And then as an adult, they'll eat the adult insect. Um, adults then develop the pulmonary system either uh, through the lungs or they're going to start to absorb through their skin. Frogs, on the other hand, begin their life as er herbivores, and then they will become uh, carnivorous as adults. Uh, by opaque, yes. So as they become more opaque, they're a little closer to hatching. They're a little further along. A little closer up on our tadpole and our salamander larva. You can see those feathery gills there. And so this was the other night. Um, one of my favorite things to do with my coworker and one of the benefits of working on a nature preserve is that I get to witness really cool uh, happenings in nature. And so uh, we go out and actively monitor the vernal pool sites and we go out at night sometimes to monitor breeding. Um, and this guy was staring right at us. He was probably the only peeper we found that night because um, they're so well hidden and so small. We knew they were there. They were singing really loud, but this is the only one that was brave enough to show its face to us. Um, we, again, it's just a magical time. We love spring. It's new life. It's um, almost like a secret, right? Vernal pools, like everyone knows about our ponds and lakes and these big bodies of water, the Hudson River. Not that I don't care about the Hudson River. It's beautiful. But these are like the forgotten little secret pools that are out there. And I think that that makes it very appealing to me. And that's why I love them so much. Um, and I, I'm so passionate about the animals that call it home. Um, again, these vernal pools, you could walk right past them. I think that's another reason I love them so much. 
They are unassuming. And um, I like the animals that tend to be either misunderstood or are unassuming. They're, that's my specialty. And so um, the vernal pool lifestyle kind of just fits right in. Um, and they're temporary. They're, 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 they come and go. And so it's a wonderful cycle that you get to witness in nature. And um, for me, I think uh, it, it's just, it's the magic of spring for me. Um, and I hope that you learn something about vernal pools and especially its inhabitants. Um, again, you know, this was more focused on amphibians. I could talk another good three, four hours on the macro invertebrates that live in the vernal pool, but um, I'll spare you that. Uh, macro invertebrates are a great sign of wetland health. Um, and depending what you find, uh, it can tell you a lot, but so can amphibians. Uh, we've known for a very long time that insects tell you about water quality, but amphibians is more of a recent thing that sci climate scientists are looking more seriously at than they ever did. So I will leave it at that. I will throw my email up in case anyone would like to reach me. That's a red F right there. Um, and then Nadia, if there are any more questions, I, th I think I've answered the ones that came in during the presentation. But you did. I think you got all of the ones uh, that came through the chat now. But if anybody else would either like to unmute or just type into the chat, we're happy to answer anything that we can. And thank you, Alyssa, for that. That was wonderful. And I have not had the chance yet to see those photos because they're so new. And they were really revealing and a really great uh, close-up look to see what you're talking about there. So thank you for those. Great. You'll have to come out with us and uh, experience it firsthand. Close by. <laughs> So sure, if anybody would like to unmute, talk about their own experiences with any of these uh, animals that we've talked about today, or any questions you have about being more involved in the amphibian migration. For instance, I'll say from my own experience, if you are out on a rainy night in spring, certain things like the peepers are incredibly difficult to see. But if you do take a moment, you do slow down, something like the spotted salamander is something that you're able to see um, and avoid on the roadway. So just taking a moment, if you're able to, to slow down as much as possible, particularly on back roads, uh, that it can be super helpful. So we do have a question here. Yes, Are they all I, I actually have a direct message question too. So uh, we'll take the one that you have first and then I'll take uh, the other one. Sure, so for everybody, the question is, are all of the amphibians done migrating or are they still potentially on the move? For the most part, they've done, they're done. The, those big nights are done. Um, and one thing that I didn't really touch on, but mitigation of that does not, you know, having volunteers out on every road, ro roadway isn't uh, feasible, but when you can identify a crossing, a high volume crossing, some um, municipalities are allowing volunteers to actually close that road during those migration nights, which I think is so cool and is never going to happen in our municipalities, but um, it's such a cool concept that's more in rural areas um, up in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, they're doing stuff like that. Um, and other ways that we can mitigate it is by building tunnels, wildlife tunnels underneath the roadways. Um, that's something that, you know, could be uh, in play again, that, that, money that's dealing with the municipality and the government. But if more people care, if more people speak up, um, you know, things might change. But for right now, awareness is the best thing we can do right now. Awareness, getting involved with the migration project. Um, that's really where it starts. And once we have a voice, then we can start changing things more at a municipal, municipal level. But um, for the most part, the municipality just cares that, um, you know, we're out there and we're not breaking into cars. We, we get pulled over by the cops uh, a little too many times. We now have signs that say amphibian migration volunteers are on the road. So it's, um, it's not as suspicious as us just walking around with flashlights in the middle of the night. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's fun time. So um, there was another question here. Uh, let's see. How common are vernal pools? They're very common. Um, some are so temporary, so they're, they're, they're so small, they're not gonna 
have any breeding animals within it. Um, they might have visiting animals, but they're not going to uh, really have the stay life for um, for these uh, breeding seasons. But um, they're very common. We just don't notice them. They're, they're all over the place and we don't notice them. Um, and I think if you start to look at depressed areas in the woods, you'll find maybe come springtime that they're full of water. And those are your vernal pool areas. Uh, what stage are the frogs and salamanders? Now it depends on the species. So uh, as you saw in the pictures, the spring peepers are starting to come out as tadpoles. None of them have started really big metamorphosis yet. They're just starting to hatch. Wood frogs should be hatching soon too. Of course, I haven't found any egg masses, which is a little concerning. We know they're there because they did cross the road. We just don't know which vernal pools they've gone to or if they're even vernal pools within our uh, property. So um, they are still within, they should still be within the egg stage. The sal spotted salamanders are definitely still in the egg stage. They haven't gotten close to hatching yet. And, um, you know, it's it takes a while. So these guys are going to go through April into May. And then starting in May, you're going to get the American toads that'll, that'll start laying. Um, and then finally, come June, you'll have your uh, uh, great tree frogs. So um, it all kind of, they all share that pool uh, as long as they can. So that's what the stages are there. Um, I look for personally, um, again, those depressed woodland areas in the summertime. If I see a low-lying area or a area that looks like it, it's concaved, um, that might be an area I want to check back in the springtime. And um, it's it, a lot of times it's in the spring is when I find them. I know where they are um, because I've stumbled upon them in the woods before. And um, if it's a good rainy season in the spring, you'll you'll see that they're full and they'll be more obvious. If it's a dry spring or we didn't have enough snow like the last two years, they're going to be less obvious. And again, this makes it hard when um, you have uh, development coming through and uh, they not offered the same protection because they might not even know they're there. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for here. Uh, where are the existing wildlife tunnels for amphibians? Good question. I would love to see more of those. Uh, wildlife bridges are also becoming popular, but it's expensive. And um, we don't have many here, uh, especially on the East Coast. Um, the West Coast seems to be implementing it a little faster than us and uh, parts of Europe are in implementing them, but uh, we're not on the bandwagon just yet. So that's something that um, for those of you who are active within your conservation boards or uh, within your communities, you know, make it known that these are options to help our native wildlife. And, you know, it doesn't just help the amphibians, but it helps any kind of animal, the turtles, crossing the roads, right? They can use these tunnels. And um, I know our police in my municipality get called out all the time for turtles in the road. And um, now they know, know what to do because uh, they have my phone number and they've called me multiple times, but um, they know what to do with those turtles. Um, but that's something that, you know, spin it in a way the municipality cares. It's going to reduce the police time getting called out to cross a turtle, or it's going to prevent a road accident by you know someone swerving to miss a turtle and, and, and um, they do work fairly well i'll just jump in here because wildlife crossings is one of my areas of interest um and they work pretty well basically what you'll find for a lot of amphibians and smaller reptiles is a sort of an exclusionary fencing that will come across the side of the road and funnel them directly underneath some sort of crossing that can be relatively small under the road and is typically graded so that there's some sort of sunlight coming in because they're predator averse of course so going into a small dark area is scary for them. Um, so this is something that's totally possible. And so what Alyssa is doing by coordinating uh, these different migratory paths um, around Westchester is providing information for the DEC, but also locally. So if we are aware that there are those hotspots and we have that data, uh, we can look into providing something like a crossing for them. Yep, but again, you need kind of that backing. And so mm -hmm. uh, the more voices that are out there, the better. And that that's what sparks change are the voices of people who care. And they're, they're small, but they're important. And as a reminder to everyone, this is being recorded. So you will all receive the recording. You can share it as you would like, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. 
All right. Well, if there are not any more questions, I will let you get back to your evenings, everyone. But I want to thank you so much for joining us. And I do encourage you to look out for our next webinar on May 12th. That will be about um, more on the aquatic side of things for if you have any sort of body of water on your property, talking about some of those aquatic invaders. So we look forward to seeing you all back then. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alyssa.